So Rachel, I'm just going to kind of let you loose on this topic. What is comparative analysis in a financial investigation? Love it so much. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So when we talk about a comparative analysis, it's really not one specific type of analysis, I'd say. It's kind of more of a category of analyses. Um, and really, there's kind of two categories of comparative analysis, I'd say, or two frameworks that we think about this kind of thing um, that we use. So sometimes we're comparing what happened versus what should have happened. And if you hang out in our office or on our Google Meet calls, you will hear us say this all the time, um, what happened versus what should have happened. And then the other kind of framework for putting together comparative analysis is uh, when you're comparing best evidence, data sources that were out of the subject's control versus data sources that were controlled by the subject. And we love to, this is a podcast, so you can't see our Venn diagram, but we love to use Venn diagrams when we do trainings about this kind of thing. Um, but really what you're looking for are going to be kind of the differences between, well, sometimes you're looking for things that are in both data sets, but more commonly, I'd say when you're looking for the loss, you're looking for things that exist in one data set, but not in the other one. So sometimes those two frameworks or those two type of analysis are actually going to be the same thing. Like a really kind of common example is if you want to look at the bank statements versus some kind of sales record data set, that could potentially both be what happened versus what should have happened and best evidence versus subject controlled data because the bank statements are going to tell you what happened, like what was what was actually deposited to the business's account, whereas the sales records are going to say what should have happened, potentially, you know, what should have been deposited to the business's account because what sales were made. And then conversely, it could also be that bank statements are going to show you what really happened, like what the subject didn't control. Like those are always our best evidence. And then the subject control data is going to be the sales records. They could have, you know, made changes to that data source that aren't reflected in the bank statements, but the bank statements are still going to be best evidence. So it just kind of depends on the particular case. I'd say which of those frameworks is more helpful. Sometimes you kind of want to use both. Yeah. And sometimes really clearly identifying, especially when working in a team, which data source are we saying represents what happened and which data source are we saying should have happened? I ran into this not long ago with working with somebody that they said, well, I would say that this supports what should have happened and this supports what happened. It doesn't really matter. It's just making sure that we're comparing data sources that actually... Um, that one verifies the other or shows us the differences. Right. Yeah. And kind of on the other end of the spectrum too, that made me think you also want to make sure that you're comparing two things that theoretically should match, you know, if there were no fraud mm -hmm. or that you understand, because a lot of times I find myself asking the client, well, if there's a discrepancy between these two data sets, what does that mean? Or is there a reason that these two data sets would ever not match? Because sometimes there are, you know, operational reasons or just because of how they use the data that they don't match. But you want to make sure you understand, yeah, that you're A, that you're actually comparing two different things and B, that you understand where you do expect them to match so that any discrepancies you can, you know, accurately interpret what the meaning of those is. Yeah. And, and we've talked lately about another kind of use of comparative analysis where we're not taking two data sets uh, that one might verify the other or that should have matching, but where we kind of have to build a data set based on best evidence. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a few cases that came to mind right away where we've done this, um, but I'm sure there are more. But yeah, sometimes the what should have happened side is not something that exists, but we have to calculate it based on a contract or um, some other documentation, some set of rules that the client provides us with. Um, the first one I thought about was the class action wage dispute that we did a couple of years ago. So to give a very simple description of that case, the plaintiffs should have been given one paid 15 minute rest break per four hours that they worked. So we had to take the time data to look at, you know, the shifts that they worked and calculate how many rest breaks should have been taken. And then we could compare that to the rest breaks that were actually taken. So in that case, there was no data set that showed these were the rest breaks that they should have taken. We had to calculate that based on other data. Um, another one that uh, we did was a mortgage servicer. And so we were trying to identify 
whether funds had been diverted or removed from escrow accounts. So we wanted to calculate what the running balance in the escrow accounts should have been. And to do that, we just used the escrow documentation. Like, you know, if you have a mortgage, you get those letters from your servicer that say, here's what you're going to put into escrow this month. Um, And then on the flip side of things, we could look at, you know, what tax and insurance payments should have actually been made by the servicer. And we could calculate those two together to see what the balance should have been in the escrow account and then compare it to the balance that was actually there. And then when we were talking about those two cases, Leah actually pointed out a third one that was an estate case where the issue was how should these various expenses of the estate have been apportioned to the different heirs based on their proportion of the overall bequest. And so we had to calculate that out based on, you know, say one heir got 20% of the estate, another heir got 20%, and a third heir got 60%. Well, we had to calculate how the expenses should have been apportioned and then compare that to how the expenses were actually paid out. So that's actually more common than we kind of realized when we first started talking about this. So you have to get a little creative. Sometimes that what should have happened side doesn't already exist, but you have to put it together. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's as easy as taking what happened in QuickBooks and then comparing that to what actually happened in the bank statement and finding those differences. Oh, this is, you know, and and really at the end of the day, that's a bank reconciliation. Yeah. On its like simplest, in its simplest state, it's a bank reconciliation. So sometimes we do that with different data sets, but sometimes there, like you said, I think, I think the best way to explain it is there is no data set that can be exported for us or, provided in some type of report that then we process like we talked about and so we have to build it on best evidence 